What's going on, folks? Welcome to episode eight of the Next Man Up Injury Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Allen, and we are back with a special Double Trouble episode tonight. I am joined by the dynamic duo, once again, of Matthew Walters and Eric Crail. Matthew, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. I'm excited to record this podcast, and the double episode's going to be fun. Eric, you ready to wrap things up on these divisional breakdowns? I'm loving it. Let's do it. All righty. Well, we kept the divisional breakdowns rolling last week with the AFC West, so if you'd like to hear that or any of our NFC divisional breakdowns, you can find them by searching for the Next Man Up Injury Podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts by following the link in the description or by visiting rideordynasty.com and looking under the podcast tab. And while you're listening to those, do us a favor. If you like what you're hearing, let us know. If you don't, let us know that too. All three of us are active on Twitter. We love talking about fantasy football and injury news, and we'd love to hear any feedback and get to know our listeners a little bit better. On this episode, we'll be breaking down the AFC North and South in that order, team by team, and we'll let you know about the most fantasy-relevant injury concerns for both divisions. For the sake of organization, we'll start with the North, and we'll go in order of their finishes in the conference from last season. So, kicking things off, we will speak about the pride and joy of the social media Sasquatch, the AFC North champion, Pittsburgh Steelers. Matthew, Chase Claypool has an ankle injury, and he's been listed as questionable for week one. Can you give us an update on his status? So, yeah, apparently he's uh, he's already back practicing again. He was dealing with a minor, minor ankle issue that they were just trying to nurse back to health, make sure he's good to go for the, the regular season. But I saw some reports that he's back practicing. He's he's going to be good to go. I wouldn't worry. Sounds like that listing is more of a protocol based listing than a real concern for us moving forward. Eric, despite some of the off-field maturity questions, the Pittsburgh receiving core is one of the more talented trios in the league. As we were talking about before, Juju Smith-Schuster was spotted doing the Milk Crate Challenge this week, which has a whole litany of reasons why it could get him on this podcast, but thankfully he's still healthy. If you could only roster one of the Pittsburgh trio of receivers in dynasty formats, who do you like out of this group? I think most of our listeners would be choosing between Deontay and Claypool. And while my gut reaction would probably have me do the same, I want to make the case for Juju and see what you guys have to say. Um, People forget that Juju was a second round pick and we know that draft capital matters when it comes to production productions for wide receivers. I feel like Juju gets all the hate because he was supposed to be the next Antonio Brown and he just wasn't exactly that. But Juju has actually been pretty dang good where in his three healthy seasons, he's been PPR's wide receiver 20, wide receiver 8, and wide receiver 17. In his last two healthy seasons, he had 166 targets and 128 targets. That's insane. Where Deontay Johnson was a third round pick who, even though he received 144 targets last year, which was more targets than Juju, he finished worse than Juju at PPR wide receiver 21. Then you have Chase Claypool, who, like Juju, is a second round pick, albeit with the physical freakness unlike the others. But I feel like it's fair to say that you're hoping Claypool becomes as good as Juju has been, right? I mean, Claypool's only NFL season was really no better than any of Juju's seasons by way of overall production, and I think it's fair to say that he may have benefited from the Steelers literally abandoning the run last year. The Steelers ranked almost dead last in the NFL for rushing attempts per game, and they ranked first ahead of the Chiefs in Dallas in pass attempts per game. So while we're all getting enamored with the targets being dished out to all three of these guys, they all might be a bit inflated, and only Juju has backed up his production multiple years. Yeah, that track record certainly speaks for itself. I mean, ideally, if I'm rostering Juju, I want him to get back to that wide receiver eight form, which he did when Antonio Brown was still there, which to me makes it more impressive. But it also speaks to how helpful it is to have another talented receiver on the other side. So when you're talking about Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool also being there, it may open it up some for Juju. And if he stays healthy, he could string it back together. Moving over to the Steelers division rival, the Baltimore Ravens. Matthew, we were all quite upset about J.K. Dobbins injury this week. Can you give us an update on his status, what his outlook looks like going forward for dynasty managers that roster Dobbins? 
Obviously, it sucks. It's been confirmed now. He, J.K. Dobbins tore his ACL. It was reported that he tore it beforehand, and then they got the MRI to confirm it. I did want to tell everyone kind of how that goes. So there's a test called the Lockman's. Basically, you're trying to shift the lower leg forward against the upper leg. And if there's no end feel, is what they call it, and it just keeps going, then odds are the ACL is torn. That's kind of the go-to test. And then they get an MRI to confirm it. So a lot of these times you hear ACL, torn ACL reported, MRI to confirm. That's probably how they're coming to that conclusion. Now, J.K. Dobbins also, there's a report that his LCL has some damage too, which could play a little bit of a factor in his recovery. He tore his hype by hyperextending his knee. He got hit right on the front and hyperextended his knee. So this is another way we've seen someone tear their ACL. We saw Blake Jarwin, the classic non-contact last year, planted, twisted, and then immediately grabbed the back of his knee. We saw Saquon last year where he was getting dragged down and his leg kind of whiplashed into the ground. And now we see a hyperextension ACL tear. So there's a bunch of different ways to tear it. And if you watch the NFL long enough, you'll pretty much see every way you can tear it. Now, luckily for him, now why this sucks, he's got basically a full year to recover before he plays another game. And the classic is 9 to 12 months for an ACL repair. And we'll see if the LCL plays a little bit of a role in coming back from that. But he's got a solid a solid year going forward. So he's got plenty of time. It just sucks that it happened at this point. Um, but if it's if you're going to tear your ACL, do it where you get a full year to recover from the ACL tear. Yeah, it's kind of like Cortland Sutton last year. Like He tore his ACL in week one, but we're expecting him to be ready to go for the full season this year. So if you're a Dobbins fantasy manager, especially in dynasty formats, yes, it's very frustrating. It's upsetting. I'm one of you, so I feel for you. Put him in your IR. Don't give up hope on him. He's gonna he will be back. And I believe that he'll be back to form quickly. Don't don't sell him cheap either, unless somehow you can flip him this year to get another really good running back and help you push for a championship. But like Kyle's saying, just hold him on your IR if if you can. Don't just sell him for peanuts at this point. Yeah, that's what it's for. Now, real Kyle. quick. Knowing Go. what you know now, would you trade J.K. Dobbins for Dalvin Cook? Mm. Depends on my team construction. If I was in a win now mode, yes, absolutely. If I was in a situation where it's like I'm a very youthful team, I may be a contender, but I'm still trying to build up to being consistent. And I'm sure you're looking at my roster right now while we're talking about this. <laughs> um, I would, I would have to consider it one to one. It would be tough. Dalvin Cook in my eyes, has two, maybe three more top-tier seasons left with his injury history, but he could prove me wrong. I I don't know. I think Dobbins has more longevity even after this injury. I think he'll come back, and I think he'll have more longevity, so it really just depends on my team construction. But if I'm in win-now mode, I would absolutely take Dalvin Cook. Hmm. Well, you could have had him. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Send the offer. All right, real quick, Matthew. Will Gus Edwards be a top 24 back this season if the Ravens don't bring in more support? The odds are in his favor to be a top 24 for sure. Um, right now, pretty much, I, so I looked at the last five years on what the running back 24 kind of finished, and in PPR points, it was around 170 points, give or take a little bit. Now, I think the Gus bus can get there, um, but also he has... The most attempts he's ever had in his career is 144 attempts. That And that was last year, splitting time with Dobbins. And the most yards he's ever had is 723. And the most touchdowns is six touchdowns. And he doesn't catch the ball. I think he can get to 170 points, fantasy-wise. But I don't see this giant ceiling that some people are throwing out for Gus Edwards right now. I just... It's not going to get there. Right now, the uh, RB23 and 24 ADP-wise is Kareem Hunt and Chase Edmonds, and I think he can finish ahead of both of them. But when I was looking at the 22 RBs in front of that, I just don't see him finishing ahead of any of them. So 
he's going to, I think he's a low end RB2. Like, yes. Seems like best. 24 is right around his ceiling unless he just takes off this year. He's never had that opportunity as the lead back, but it'll be interesting to see what he can do with that opportunity. And the Ravens have shown time and time again that they want to split that backfield, um, which funny enough, Tyson Williams now has reportedly jumped Justice Hill on the depth chart, which Justice Hill's been dealing with his own ankle issue, which probably played a role in that. So I think they're just going to be split in time. Lamar Lamar is going to be running. He doesn't pass to the RBs. Like It's just not a fun RB to have on your team. And I think people jump to the conclusion that he's automatically going to just burst forth into this giant role, which we've seen time and time again. That's just not how the Ravens use him. Opportunities there. The question this year will be, is the talent there? Now, Eric, the Ravens wide receiver room, they've got all kinds of injuries going on. We have Hollywood Brown, Miles Boykin, Sammy Watkins, Rashad Bateman, all listed as questionable for week one. Tell me, who's healthy? When will we be back at full strength in Baltimore? What's going on? <laughs> well, where do we start? Um, Marquise Brown is dealing with a hamstring injury. And if you haven't listened to a single one of our episodes, then you need to know one thing, which is we take hamstring injuries seriously. I feel like you always get hamstring injury questions. I'm sorry. I need to work on that. there are plenty. Hamstrings are a plenty. The resident (laughs) hamstring expert. It's always Eric. Eric is always the hamstring. (laughs) People are going to think I'm obsessed, but um, we do take them seriously. And listen, I mean, Brown hasn't practiced since the second day of practice in August. While that's probably enough time for him to unload his muscles for pain reduction, it might not be enough time to reload his muscles to strengthen so that he's able to handle the workload of an NFL season. Now, John Harbaugh has said that he's of the coaching mindset where it's not worth it to have his starters working hard in the preseason if it means they won't be at 100% for week one. I agree. So it's possible that Harbaugh is intentionally resting Brown so that he will be at 100% next week. But because of the nature of the injury and the range uh, range of outcomes associated with it, Marquise Brown is just on my radar as a guy who, even if he does play week one, he might not play a full season. So, I mean, ultimately, he grades out as questionable to me for his availability in week one and even more questionable for his availability through the 16-game season. Now, Sammy Watkins is a more ambiguous issue. He's been dealing with an undisclosed injury for about two weeks, and although Harbaugh has already referred to it as a normal camp thing, It's worth noting that Watkins hasn't played a full season since he was a rookie in 2014. Watkins is now a 28-year-old veteran. He's probably nearing the end of his career, and he's not going to be healing as quickly or effectively as he could have when he was younger. So, I mean, Sammy missed five games last year from his second hamstring injury, and we know that these things can be recurrent. I mean, I think it's a bit unfair to speculate what this injury is without more information, but it may be, um, you know, that hamstring injury coming back to bite him in the butt. Um, I think he'll be fine for week one, but I think it's a bad bet to say that he'll play all 16 games this year. Miles Boykin is also dealing with a hamstring injury. He grades out to me as questionable for week one. Um, Rashad Bateman, I think, is a much more interesting prospect, but, you know, he will not be ready for week one. He had core muscle surgery and he was given a specific timeline of six to eight weeks for return to play. I think, you know, you should remember that even when he does return, um, it takes time for rookie wide receivers to acclimate to the NFL level. Justin Jefferson didn't really come on until the middle of the season. And Bateman has also missed all of preseason. So he's definitely got an uphill to climb to be productive, even when he does return when he's healthy. Yeah, if you can't be on the field, it's tough to learn an NFL playbook, and it's tough to earn some trust with a new quarterback to you. So I am avoiding this receiver room at all costs until further notice. Now moving over to Cleveland, Matthew, I finally got a hamstring question for you. You ready? I'm ready. (laughs) Miles Garrett, IDP. He's dealing with a hamstring injury of his own. What is his outlook for the beginning of the season? So this was actually interesting because apparently he's been dealing with it since August 10th. And they reported at that time that he was day to day. But now we're getting close to three or four weeks away from that. And he's still dealing with it. So it just goes to show that these hamstring injuries, even if they are minor at the 
beginning of them, they can linger and they can be a problem going forward. Hopefully he's good to go in two weeks, but I mean, you just, you just never know with a hamstring and he could easily have a setback and this could easily be something that he's dealing with all season or it could be something that you know he's good to go week one and it'll be uh he'll be fine going forward that's what I'm inclined to believe since at the beginning they were they were reporting that it was pretty minor and he was day-to-day at that time but it is a little worrisome that it's three weeks later and he's still kind of iffy with it yeah certainly something to keep an eye on Eric OBJ tore his ACL last season, as we know, missed most of the year. What's his outlook for week one? Is he going to be ready? Yeah, I believe OBJ will play play week one. But if you haven't checked out my article on RiderDynasty.com on running back and wide receiver return to play after ACL, you should. The short and sweet of it would be that wide receivers typically have a harder time producing after ACL surgery especially if you're over the age of 26, Odell is 28, and he does carry elite talent and early production, which we know matters. But ultimately, you know, OBJ carries more value by namesake to me than he does in expected production in 2021. So I'm not expecting too much out of him this year. Yeah, he was certainly somebody that burst onto the scene with the Giants and put up insane numbers. And since then, he has just not reached that potential. That one catch he had was what kind of but what made a catch. his career. <laughs> it was a great catch. Yeah, that catch certainly vaulted him into the minds of fans. But fantasy-wise, he did have a couple of really good seasons while while Eli was still there. Moving on up to Cincinnati. The Bengals don't currently have any fantasy-relevant injuries. When Burrow was healthy last season, this offense was certainly much better and much more fantasy relevant than it was without him. They added one of the most talented receiver prospects in the draft in Jamar Chase to their already impressive duo of Tyler Boyd and T. Higgins. Now, for both of you, which of these three do you see emerging as the wide receiver one in Cincinnati this season? Matthew? I feel like it has to be T. Higgins, right? He had 194 PPR points last year. He's 6'4". He's a big body guy. They're going to throw him the ball. They like to throw him the ball. Uh, Tyler Boyd, while I do like him and he's a great possession receiver, I feel like he just kind of is what he is. He doesn't have super high upside, but he's safe. Um, And Jamar Chase is just kind of the wild card for this year. Burrow should love him because they were college, college teammates and they were balling out together, but I just... In my mind, I can't see him overtaking T. Higgins as the number one receiver for the Bengals this year. Yeah, I think the answer is almost certainly T. Higgins. I mean, you want to hear the consistent drumbeat out of camp hyping up the talent and explosiveness and awesomeness of a player heading into the season. And we've heard this drumbeat for guys like Elijah Moore and Terrace Marshall, but not for Jamar Chase. I mean, Chase has actually been very polarizing this season, where we know from a pure prospect standpoint that he's almost bust-proof, but Chase has stunk up the place in almost any way you look at it. He, I think, even had like pro fantasy football's worst graded preseason rank. So that, plus knowing that wide receivers typically take a little bit to acclimate to the NFL, um, it makes me feel more confident that Chase isn't going to step in and take over the wide receiver room this year. I think it's definitely going to be T. Higgins from what he showed last year. Um, Higgins has received tons of camp praise, and he's looked awesome in his short preseason outings. Um, I think we're all expecting him to take a sophomore leap and be one of, if not the favorite, target from Joe Burrow. So I'm pretty confident that it's T. Higgins over Chase in 2021 and definitely T. Higgins over Tyler Boyd. Yeah, I really like T. Higgins. And I feel like he will be the one here, but I really think Tyler Boyd is being swept under the rug and he is a fantastic value. His ADP is dropping because of the popularity of Higgins and Chase, but he's certainly no slouch. He's been making plays in camp. He's been making plays in the preseason. He's not somebody that I look at and I think, oh, he's not going to do that great. The Bengals are going to be playing from behind. They're going to be throwing the ball. I think all three of these guys will be fantasy relevant. And if you can trot out Tyler Boyd in your flex, as your third option, fourth option at wide receiver, you're doing something right in my book. Yeah, he's a sneaky flex. Alrighty, that wraps things up for the AFC North. Now let's travel down and talk a little bit about the AFC South. 
Kicking things off in the South, we have the AFC South champion, Tennessee Titans. Now, the Titans have quite a few players and personnel on the COVID list already this season, including starting quarterback Ryan Tannehill and head coach Mike Vrabel. And I saw somebody raise the question on Twitter, and if you're listening to this and you're the one who raised the question, I apologize that I forgot who it was. But the Titans have violated protocols last season. They already have a big outbreak within their facilities this year. Matthew, at what point do you think the league might start investigating or potentially pull up a punishment for the Titans for this? I don't think the Titans should be punished. Now, obviously, last year they violated protocols, and I can't remember if they were punished for that or not. They definitely should have been last year. Um, but this year, the team is 97% vaccinated and also by all accounts they are doing everything they've been asked to do and haven't broken any protocols i just i don't feel like you should punish a team now simply because they are having an outbreak when they're doing everything they've been asked to do at this point um now if it comes out that people are lying and stuff isn't um as it should be then okay sure that's a different story but by all accounts right now they're they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing yeah hey i mean that goes to show a little bit of research figure it out we can think for ourselves you know we might think oh gosh they have covid outbreak that's you know they're probably going to nightclubs and going to bars and stuff but i mean they're 97 percent vaccinated and outbreaks happen you know, you can't help it. If somebody gets sick because their little kid brought something home from school, it happens. It's just awkward because it's the team that did break protocols last yeah. year. All which, eyes are on you already, and then I mean, it comes up again. It's hard to... I get that. It's hard to argue It makes against. sense. Absolutely. Eric, let's say that it does come out that they have broken protocol. What do you think could be a potential punishment from the league? Are we looking at fines, maybe draft picks being taken away? We know that the NFL is taking this extremely seriously. It cost them a ton of money last year. Um, and I mean, I'm honestly, I'm not totally savvy to the rules and regs of COVID-19 punishments this year, but it's my understanding that the NFL is putting it all on the clubs where, you know, if you want to go out and catch COVID fine, but you're going to end up forfeiting the game and taking the L and that's probably a big enough punishment for most teams to try and straighten out their end. I don't know that there's anything set in stone. I know that the NFLPA just agreed with the NFL, um, to more COVID testing throughout the season than they were already having. So it'll be interesting to see if there's an uptick or if numbers kind of stay the same or even get better with more people getting vaccinated. That's enough about that. Let's talk about injuries. So they have a fantastic, arguably the best wide receiver duo in the NFL, but both of them currently have some question marks. Matthew, A.J. Brown had bilateral knee surgery in the offseason. He's currently listed questionable with a knee ailment of some sort. Can you provide us an update and some clarity on what's going on there? Um, I wish I could provide more clarity but it's awkward because we really don't know what this knee issue is is it related to the cleanup procedures he had back in january is it he just dealing with a little tendonitis did he get a sprain like we don't know no one has said anything we just know hey he's dealing with a knee issue uh he's questionable for week one by his account, he's going to be good to go. By the team's account, he's going to be good to go. But honestly, we have no idea what the knee issue is, so it's hard to even speculate what it what could be. Like, I don't even know where to begin with it. Yeah, as a fan and a fantasy manager that has him on a dynasty roster, I'm hoping that it's just precautionary. He's still recovering. We're going to take it easy, and it's not something long-term. Eric. Moving over to the other side of the wide receiver room, we have Julio Jones. Currently, his status is listed as questionable, but it's for an undisclosed injury. Do we know what's going on with Julio? You know, Julio's been questionable with an injury for about five years now. <sighs> and he's almost always on the injury report, but he almost always plays. Again, it's worth noting that Julio missed half the season last year with a pretty severe hamstring injury. And you know we don't like those, so... Maybe this is now a recurrent thing. I mean, Julio's 32. He's not going to handle recurrent injuries as well as he used to, but I give most players a pass for 2020's wonky season. I'll believe it when I see it. Until then, it's business as usual for me. I think this is just how Julio rolls, and we'll see him ready to go in week one. Yeah, it seems like he's always got like a small foot injury or ankle injury or something nagging him. So hopefully it's not the hamstrings bothering him again. Hopefully they're just taking it easy on the veteran. 
Moving on up I-65, we go to the Indianapolis Colts. Matthew, Quentin Nelson, Eric Fisher, Sam TV. One of the best offensive lines in the league is already banged up. How does this affect your perception on what Jonathan Taylor is going to be able to produce this season? Obviously, it's affecting his ADP already. He's he was a first round pick early in the in the fall, and now he's creeping into the second round and getting lower and lower and lower. So people are worried about it now. We see it time and time again that the O line. Why, yes, they play a role in the running back being able to do their job. We still see these top RBs produce even with bad O-lines. We saw it with Saquon a couple years ago and James Robinson last year. I mean, the Jags aren't known for their offensive line. Like, these these top-end running backs can still produce even if their O-line is not where it should be. So I'm not overly concerned it's minorly concerning now he did have 252 ppr points last year which is pretty elite by the way i rank him um i say 250 ppr points makes you an elite running back and most of the time a second year rb produces more than they did their rookie season so by all accounts jonathan taylor should have a pretty pretty good year you know what I'm hearing here for all you crypto nerds out there? Buy the dip. Eric, T.Y. Hilton has a neck injury. What's going on with him? Who do we think is going to stand to benefit the most in Indiana's wide receiver room? Indianapolis's wide receiver. Well, this is really bad. Um, T.Y. Hilton is out with a vague issue that I think Frank Reich only re- referred to as a disc issue. And multiple multiple reports are saying that he's out. Uh, for at least you know a few weeks this is the kind of injury for an old veteran that can really knock you out I think it's fair to project that he's back sooner than later but I could really see this being something that bothers him all year Um, so someone is gonna have to step up and while many people love Michael Pittman I'm not in that camp Um, I do think Pittman gets more targets but so will probably other guys like Paris Campbell, Michael Ooh. Strachan, who's having a great camp, and probably Jonathan Taylor. I am in the camp of pounding the table for Paris Campbell. He's had, yes, he's been hurt, but both of his injuries were just tough luck contact injuries. They weren't anything freak where I was like, oh, that's a hamstring, or he was just running and his ACL popped. It was both of them were contact injuries, freak accidents where you miss a whole year. Yes, it's tough to miss a whole season and come back, but he's looked good in the preseason. Hearing all his interviews and everything, the way he's talking, he sounds like he's excited to be back out there, that he's put the injuries in the past. He's not worried about that. He's ready to move forward. And with this T.Y. Hilton injury news coming out, I'm excited to see what he's able to do in that position. Yeah, I think this could be his year. Somebody's got to catch the ball for him. Let's do it. Matthew, speaking of catching the ball, somebody's got to throw it. Carson Wentz, can you give us a quick update on if he's going to be ready for week one? It's looking like it, but he also got placed in COVID protocol, so that could maybe hinder his rehab a little bit. Before he was placed in that, the timeline when he had surgery to basically remove a little bone fragment that had kind of broken off in his foot, which funny enough, they think he broke it in high school and it just, this recent injury dislodged it. But anyway, they removed it and the timeline was five to 12 weeks. It was looking like he was going to really hit that week one, be back. But now with COVID, who knows if that makes his rehab take a little bit longer. And now instead of week one, he's back week two. But by all accounts, it was on the earlier time frame than it was the 12 weeks. He's missing half the season that some people were fearing when it first happened. Yeah, the good news is he has a whole extra week in between the end of the preseason and the beginning of the regular season to hopefully get out of the COVID protocol and back on the field and get ready to go for week one. So going down south to Houston with the Texans, not a ton of fantasy relevant injuries, injury news here. And we're going to stay away from legal speculation as that is certainly not my area of expertise. And I don't believe either of you are lawyers. Um, So let's talk upside at other positions. Brandon Cooks will forever be one of my favorite players, both as a Patriots fan and a football fan. He's clearly the number one receiver in Houston right now, and after him, there's certainly an opening for someone to step up. Who do you guys think has the best opportunity to see some fantasy relevance in Houston this year at wide receiver? Eric? My dart throw would be Nico Collins. 
I like him, don't love him as a prospect, but I tell you, I really don't love the other guys on this roster at the wide receiver position. I mean, this is already an offense that we're projecting really low output from, so I'm certainly not expecting to get two 1,000-yard receivers at the end of the year from this club, but we've seen what the other wide receivers can do, and it's nothing to get excited about. So my pick is Nico Collins because of the unknown of what it, at least he could be. Yeah, Matthew, who you got? Yeah, I agree completely. The only wide receivers I want are Cooks and Nico Collins. Um, but really, this team is going to be garbage this year. I garbage. just do not. I, I don't know if they'll win a game. Like, I know crazy thing. It's hard to not do that in the NFL. Like, usually a team gets at least one win. I But I just cannot see this team winning another game do do you want to know the other receivers they anthony miller that's a fun one um kiki qt was mm-hmm. cut today so he's not even on the team Whoa. anymore um and chris conley who what hey, go dogs. what a receiving core and let's not get started on their running backs and their qb and that yeah it's just that that team's gonna be lucky to win a game every position it seems like there's a ton of options that you look at and just go eh, all right I don't want them on my bench on my 30 team nope. dynasty. Hey, <laughs> bonus bonus question for you. I just looked it up. The Vegas odds for over under on wins for this for the Houston Texans is 4. Are you taking the over or under on 4 oh, wow. wins? For Hammer Houston? the What's under. The spread. Hammer Pound I just, the under. They, they, in as many <laughs> sports books as you can find. I will bet my life savings on I'm just kidding. I don't I'm not going to do that, yeah, but I would take the under. But I, I, I don't even see how it can be that high. Like under odds or minus 115, Eric. Sold. Sold. Put who, me, put it on the you, board. Who do you think would have the better wide receiver room going into this year? The Lions or the Texans? Texans because of Brandon Cooks. Solely because of Cooks. Are, are yes, we absolutely. only talking wide receivers or are we throwing Hawkinson in? Brandon, there? only wide receivers. Oh, then probably brandon cooks puts in brandon ahead brandon cooks is better than tyra williams yeah. and quintez cephas let's say cooks is out now who? oh it's the lions i'd go with the lions okay because of amon ross st brown shout out ryan the sun god the sun god himself all righty down to jacksonville let's close out this division eric travis Etienne has a list frank fracture in his foot he's on ir he is done for the year with this kind of injury what does recovery look like and how will he do once he's back on the field right so a list frank injury describes an injury to either the bone or the ligaments of the middle of your foot folks who receive surgery like Etienne likely had both bone and ligament implicated in, in the injury Folks who have surgery have similar career lengths as non-surgical candidates. However, it usually takes longer for the surgical folks, and they might miss some games in the next year. Etienne's injury occurred early enough, so I think he'll be ready for week one in 2022. As for player performance, we do see about a 21% decrease in performance the year immediately after surgery, but it's acknowledged that this might be due to just missing games. Um, and not being ready to play yet, rather than actually performing worse when they do play. And I think Etienne will be ready for week one, so I don't think that should be an issue for him. It's worth mentioning that about 50% of athletes get the hardware that was implanted for the surgery removed later. So, you know, if, if you see a headline later that Etienne had another surgery on her foot, don't panic. Maybe buy the dip even, um, because that's normal and it's probably a good thing. Um, lastly, it's worth mentioning that there's evidence, um, that there is no evidence for repeat Liz Frank injuries, especially ones that are surgically repaired with plenty of times to heal. So I'm not too concerned about this being a recurrent issue. His biggest hurdle in my, hurdle in my eyes is simply that he didn't get a chance yet to take control as the workhorse running back for the club. But his draft capital is so high that I think Urban Meyer will be eager to cash in on the value that they paid to acquire him in the draft. And Etienne, I think, will get his shot in 2022 like they expected him to get in 2021. Yeah, he's only 22 years old. He has the advantage of youth and being able to take this season. Okay, I'm not going to be playing, but I can study the playbook. I can be there. I can support my team. I can make a difference in other ways. At 22 years old, your body doesn't even reach peak bone density until you're 25, 26 years old. So really, if he gets this fixed, they 
even if they do end up going back and taking the hardware out, he's still going to be healing, regenerating new bone at a quicker rate than somebody who's older in their career, such as Greg Olson a couple years ago when he suffered a Liz Frank. When he came back, he just never looked the same, and that's kind of when his career started to dip. So I don't look at Travis Etienne as somebody who's going to just fall off like somebody that would be older in their career. True that, Kyle. Matthew, um, oops, go ahead. Go, go. Oh, I was curious. I mean, who would you guys rather have, Etienne Akers or J.K. Dobbins? I'd prefer Dobbins. Out of those, I would prefer Dobbins just because you know what you're getting. Right. Even when he comes back, even if he's 90% of what he was before, you know what you're getting. ETN, we haven't seen him play in the NFL at all. I, I just Now, if you ask me if you ask me ETN or Akers, I would say ETN because that's going to be an easier one to recover from and get back on the field. With Akers, after an Achilles, you don't know what he's going to look like coming back. And even if he is cleared medically... The mental side of that, for me, I think is going to be harder than a fracture. Yeah, Acres, it's a it was a two year recovery to get possibly back to what you were, and we weren't a hundred percent sure what he was before. It is what it is. Okay. Dobbins, Et, and Acres in that order. Okay. From an injury standpoint, as far as fantasy value, if they were all at 100%, it would be a different conversation. Moving on to the Jacksonville wide receiver room, Matthew, Marvin Jones and DJ Chark both. Can you give us an update on what's going on with them and their questionable status? So yeah, Marvin Jones is dealing with the AC joint sprain, which basically kind of on the outside of your shoulder, there's a joint there that uh, when you lift your arm, you never really notice it moving. Um, unless you have issues with it, and then it hurts really bad when you go up to make a catch. Now, by all accounts, it was just a minor AC joint sprain. If it's a kind of a major one, a grade three, you can get what's called a piano key sign, which means your collarbone, where that AC joint connects, pops up and looks like a piano key, and you can press down on it. Um, by all accounts, he did not have that. It was just uh, a grade one, but that's still painful when you lift your arm, painful when you go to make a catch. Now, DJ Chark had a hairline fracture in one of his fingers, had surgery to fix it, should be good by week one, as well as Marvin Jones should be good by week one, but both these guys have missed quite a bit of time, which has led to Chenault kind of being the go-to wide receiver so we'll see kind of how that all breaks down this year marvin jones funny enough was the wide receiver 18 last year um for a different team with 227 points so he's kind of that big boomer bust guy always kind of seems like what it is and he's going as wide receiver 49 right now so if you can get him and possibly throw him in your flex i mean there's worse boomer bust guys to put there but Personally, I kind of want Chenault out of them. I believe in the talent more than the other two. And he's actually had the preseason to work with the, the rookie QB to be on the same page. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up LaVisca Chenault right there. Um, in Urban Meyer's offense, we don't really know what to expect, what it's going to look like when they actually come out with all the starters, with Trevor Lawrence at QB. We don't know what they're going to look like, what they're going to run. But do you guys think with these two possibly missing some time, if LaVisca Chenault has the opportunity to come out as a candidate to be a top 12 receiver this year? That's a little rich for me. Top 20? Definitely. I wouldn't bet on top 12. But this is a bad team that should be throwing the ball a lot. So the the opportunity is there. But yeah, I wouldn't bet on top 12. He's not a wide receiver one yet for me either. He seems to be one of the most talked about people on fantasy Twitter. Everybody's saying that he's going to be Urban Meyer's Percy Harvin player this year. I don't know that that necessarily spells wide receiver one status, but I would expect him to get a lot of action this season. Alrighty, guys. Last week's trivia was a doozy. So I've got a couple questions for you this week that should help boost your scores. We've got two questions, one for each division. Both of them have a bonus question with the option to score multiple points on the bonus question. So this week, I'm going to have both of you write down your answers. We're going to kick it off with the AFC North. Start the music. Name the running back who led the Baltimore Ravens in carries in both 2018 and 2020. Bonus question. Can you name the two Ravens players who rushed for over 1,000 yards in 2019? Both ready? 
three, two, one. Alrighty. Name the running back who led the Baltimore Ravens in carries in 2018 and 2020. The correct answer was Gus Edwards. Yes. Dang it. Eric Boom. said Mark Ingram. Matthew was correct and said Gus Edwards. And the bonus question was, can you name the two Ravens players who rushed for over 1,000 yards in 2019? The correct answer was Lamar Jackson and Mark Ingram. Oh, And you are yeah. both correct. So Let's both, go. Both of you get the two bonus points. Matthew cashed in all three. Thank Donate you to file. the Gus Edwards research I did earlier today. That's right. If you follow me and pay attention to me on Twitter, you would have known that Gus Edwards trivia. Eric. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Going down to the AFC South. Brandon Cooks became just the second receiver in NFL history to record 1,000 yards with four different teams. Can you name the first player to accomplish this feat? And for bonus points, can you name the four teams that this player recorded 1,000 yards with? You will get a point for each team that you name correctly. First player in the history of football? Of the NFL to record 1,000 yards with four different teams. Three, two, one. Matthew says... Terrell Owens. Owens. Yeah, you are close. Guy. Terrell Owens did it with three. Jerry Rice also did it with three. And Randy Moss also did it with three. Ah, teams, I, I believe. Randy and Randy Eric's guess mind. was Yo Mama, which is also incorrect. My mother was not an NFL wide receiver, contrary to popular belief. The correct answer. He shares a name with Brandon Cooks. However, it's spelled differently. It is Brandon Marshall. Oh, oh wow. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have okay. got that one. Nope. Okay. Bonus points. Not on the radar. Speed round. Get ready. I'm going to count down from 10. You will get a bonus point for each of the four teams that he recorded 1,000 yards with. Go. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. I'm totally guessing the last three, one, but I'm done. 2. 1. Answers. The correct answers were Denver. Miami, oh, Chicago, and the New York Jets. So, hold it up for me. So, Matthew got one with the Jets. Eric gets Jets, Bears, and Dolphins gets three. All righty. So, mm. I'm going to have to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, Eric got three on that one and two on the first. So, you got five points this week, Eric. Matthew, you got three on the first question and one there. So, you got four points this week which puts us at an overall tie of 5-5, five to five, heading into week one of the NFL regular season when we will see you guys next. I am going to do my darndest to make sure that we can live stream that podcast. We are very excited for the season to get kicked off. All righty, guys, that's going to wrap it up for our division injury breakdowns. Of course, if you have any questions before the season starts, please feel free to reach out to each of us on Twitter. Matthew, where can we find you on the Twitter machine? You can find me at Fantasy Ferret. That's mainly my fantasy football account. All righty. Eric, how can the people ask you questions? All right. I am the Nighthawk PT. You can find me on Twitter at FF underscore Nighthawk. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Before I sign off, we have to give a big shout out to a personal friend of mine and friend of the podcast, John C., for creating all of our intro and outro music. If you are looking for music for your podcast, for your videos, or you just want to hear some sweet tunes, you can reach out to him at johncmusic at gmail.com. That's J-O-N-S-E-E music at gmail.com. We were effectively able to pull a Dana White and nerf the John C with an H from the internet. Don't try to email John C with an H. That email does not exist. Again, my name is Kyle Allen. You can find me on Twitter at kallen underscore four. I'm also happy to interact with you give you updates on injuries, just reach out and ask any of us. And don't forget to check out RideOrDynasty.com from the latest from our writer's room and give us a follow on Twitter at RideOrDynasty. And one last thing before we go, always remember that the best ability is availability. Peace. Peace.